Howdy, my name is Frederick Jacklich, and this is my final presentation for my EEL 6509 wireless communications class. I decided to do my project on the exploration of Bluetooth frequency hopping spread spectrum. Okay, here's my overview. I'm going to just go through a quick introduction um, where I, I talk about what is the frequency hopping spread, spread spectrum and the history of Bluetooth and its technology. Uh, and then I talk about how I kind of tackled this project in two parts, where I look into how is the technology currently used in both uh, the military and in the civilian worlds. And I also uh, generated some MATLAB codes and did a quick little exercise to kind of explore how the frequency hopping spread spectrum works. I then evaluate my uh, MATLAB exercise and code and see how it performed up to uh, in the presence of an interference signal. And then I'll follow up with some related work and new technology related to Bluetooth and finish with summary and conclusions. So what is the frequency hopping spread spectrum? Uh, basically, it's a technique where you hop signals across several different frequency channels. This is all based on a small network called a PicoNet, uh, Pico meaning small, where you have a single master device and one to seven slave devices. Um, this is kind of important because you can have multiple Pico nets in the same, in close proximity in the same room, and they shouldn't interfere with each other because of this ability for the signal to hop. So where did the name Bluetooth come from? Everyone knows what it is, but not too many people know where it comes from. And I apologize in advance if I butcher this, but it's named after a 10th century Viking monarch named Harold Blatend Gormson. Um, Blatend literally meaning blue tooth. I suppose the guy had a blue tooth. He's uh, known for uniting uh, modern day Denmark and Norway in a very peaceful way. He didn't have to conquer the countries or the region. He actually was able to bring local, local tribal leaders together uh, and come to an agreement at, under his reign. But that still doesn't really get to where Bluetooth technology really comes from. Um, in 1994, the Swedish company Ericsson Mobile Communications was looking into an inexpensive uh, low power radio interface between mobile phones. At that time, if you want to connect, it, connect two mobile phones together, you needed cables and PC cards. Um, so they started doing research into this and by 1998, Intel, IBM, Toshiba, Ericsson, and Nokia, all these different companies were looking into the same kind of inexpensive, low power, you know, radio technology, and they've decided to come together to form the Bluetooth Special Interest Group, a royalty-free uh, group. So they did it very peacefully, just like how Harold Blatant brought his group together um, to create a standard for short-range, low-power radio link. In the lower right, you can see how the Bluetooth um, Special Interest Group, or SIG, decided to honor the, the Viking monarch by making the Bluetooth symbol the combination of the H and B runic initials. So that gets into, now we have Bluetooth technology. It's been around for you know almost two decades now. What does it do? How does it work? Well, it, it operates on the 2.4 gigahertz band uh, to transmit packets of information from a master device to its slaved devices. It's known uh, to work on the, IS, the ISM band or the Industrial Scientific Medicine band, um, and it uses 79 radio frequency channels, each spaced one megahertz apart. Now the problem comes up is, is in the ISM band, there's a lot of other things that also work. Um, in that region, which includes wireless LANs, baby monitors, microwave ovens, you know, medical equipment, uh, military radars, and industrial heaters. You can even do a, a little experiment where you try to put your Bluetooth phone um, next to a microwave while it's, while it's operating and see if you can listen to your tunes on your wireless, you know, headphones. It probably won't work. And, and please note, don't actually put your phone inside the microwave and turn it on yeah, that doesn't work very well. So now we get into um, the first part of the two-part series of my project, which is, you know, how is the frequency hopping spread spectrum used today? Um, now, we all know what Bluetooth is, but how does the military use it? 
Um, they use it for mostly for wireless communications. There is a need <clears throat> to transmit data in a secure manner. Um, you've going to have a, a lot of friendly forces in the battle space, and you've got potential enemies trying to listen into your transmissions. Uh, you need to find a way to easily, you know, secure your communications at, while allowing your friendly forces to listen to you, but denying the enemy. Uh, the way that they've done, a, they've gotten around this is by creating the um, different systems, depending on whether you are on the ground or in the air. A lot of ground forces use the SINCARS, the single channel ground and airborne radio system, and a lot of air units use uh, the AN ARC 164 Have Quick 2 system. Uh, the Have Quick 2 is on the left and the SINCARS is on the right. So each of these systems actually uses different um, frequency bands, so they're not very compatible with each other, they're not compatible with each other at all. Uh, but what they do to operate them, you have to know a time of day, usually generated from uh, a GPS signal, uh, a word of the day, which is like a six-digit, six-segment stream of data that you need to input uh, into your device, and a net number, which allows for multiple words of the day, word of the day, multiple wads to be used simultaneously uh, without f interfering with each other. So why is this important? It means that uh, if you want to talk to a particular aircraft, you just dial in the appropriately, appropriate sequence and you can talk to them and your frequency will hop together in sync with each other so that you're not stepping on or interfering with someone else trying to communicate to his buddy. So let's talk into civilian use, which is mostly Bluetooth from my research. Um, not too many hardy uh, devices like you see in the military. Uh, mostly it's just, you know, your smartphones, <clears throat> your tablets, and your computers. And these are known as essential devices. Um, they're, they, what they do is they send data, you know, between mobile devices. Um, you can use them to set up an ad hoc network between computers to transfer data, or you can tether smartphones to computers to use the, the, the mobile networks instead of, say, using the Wi-Fi network. Uh, which can consume less battery power, so you can see where it could be advantageous to use this technique. Other devices that use Bluetooth technology are known as peripheral devices. These include headsets, stereos, your mice and keyboard, your game pads, printers, uh, various sensors around the house, could be your car. Um, so there's a nice little graphic there at the bottom where you know you're connecting to both you know your you can connect your phone to your home sensor to an EKG to um, your car, what this does is it creates an internet of, of things that I'll get a little bit further into later on in the presentation. So here's where I'm gonna start talking about the second portion of my project, which is the MATLAB exercise into the frequency hopping spread spectrum. Uh, the source code was provided on the MathWorks website, and here's the link. Um, but for the most part, what that code was was a transmitter. What I wanted to do was introduce a potential interference PicoNet and uh, make a receiver and see what kind of signal I can get back and how well does this technology perform in the presence of an interfering signal. So here's just a, a, a block diagram. Uh, so on the left is the transmitter where you have your original data sequence. You will create a spreading code um, you'll combine those two and run it through a modulator, which has your carrier frequency. Um, now, you'll usually transfer it through the air. The channel is just open air, line of sight, where it will be demodulated with the same carrier. You have to know that the two, the transmitter and the receiver, have to be in sync. Otherwise, the system will not communicate. Um, and then you'll, you'll desynchronize and get the final output code. Um, I added a little uh, box there for the interference PicoNet, which is just it's just the possibility of another PicoNet operating at the same time. And there's always a potential for interference, even though that potential is very, very small. So let's dive into the code here. Uh, the first part of it was to build a transmitter. Um, and this code was, again, provided by the MathWorks website. But we generated uh, 25 bits and then created uh, 60 samples for one cosine 
and these bits will either be um, a one or a negative one, um, and that's important later for the BPSK modulation. Um, we use a minus one to represent a logical zero, and a one represents a logical one. It's at the same time we also create the carrier signal uh, along with the, the bit stream. This slide talks about BPSK modulation. Uh, the diagram, constellation diagram is on the right where you've got either a positive one or a negative one and that's just kind of backed up in the math on the left. All right, going through this BPSK math here, um, S of N of T is the signal. E of B is the energy per bit. TB is the bit duration. F is your frequency of your baseband and T is your time. So if the value is positive, you're gonna get a one, you're gonna return a one. And if it's negative, you're gonna return a zero, or in this case, a negative one. The reason why this is important is because you want to have a 180 degree phase shift between your logical one and your logical zero. And the BPSK or binary phase shift king allows you to do this. Okay, so here we start creating six different carrier frequency channels at 10, 20, 30, 40, 60, and 120 hertz. Um, I decided to use six because that's what came with the source code. I decided not to add any more to it because it's a little bit easier um, to, to evaluate later on when you have six channels versus 79 channels that Bluetooth has. Um, it's, it, you increase the probability of collisions, um, but that's okay because then you're able to see how robust the system is. And on the right, you know, we use the, the Randy function to say as a bit goes through, it's going to get a random uh, carrier frequency or channel that it's going to bounce on. So, so the first bit might have the, let's see, case two, which is 20 hertz. Then your second bit might be case one, which is 10 hertz. Your third bit might have 120 hertz. Your fourth bit might have 10 hertz and your fifth bit might have 30 hertz and so on and so forth as it creates um, a stream of varying frequencies. So this slide brings together all of the information uh, thus far for the transmitter. At the very top left, you have your original bit sequence of ones and negative ones. Uh, the BPSK modulated signal is right below it. And I want you to notice that every time it shifts between a negative one to a one or vice versa, there's a 180 degree phase shift in the signal to represent those changing um, bits. Um, then what you're going to do is you're going to run it through the spread signal with the six different random frequencies. Um, and once you combine the two, you get your actual frequency hot spread spectrum signal. That signal is what's going to be transmitted. Um, in this case, it's simulated through the air. It's just done on, on software, but um, that's what you can kind of expect your phone or your computer, whatever Bluetooth um, primary device to be pumping out. Again, in this case, we're using six frequencies instead of 79. Now on the right, again, it's, it's the same frequency hop spread spectrum signal, but I decided to take the uh, FES Fourier transform here. Um, it, it's duplicated, but on the left, you can see how you can, um, it, it peaks at uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, you have 120 in there, you have 60. It's a little hard to see, but you can see 